offering tools for empowerment and success varying from a handful of students to the local community to the developing world. is a very unique place. We have three things happening simultaneously. We have a full production mill work, so we make a product. We have a historic park, so we're open to the public for tours, so we have visitors coming through all the time. And then we have the school, which is a partnership with the Humboldt County Office of Education. The kids have a classroom site where they do academic stuff that ties in with the hands-on work that they do here. So they do blacksmithing ceramics, they give tours and talk with the visitors, all kinds of hands-on stuff. In the course of a day, we'll have kids come into the office to show us something that we've made. We'll make a sale for some gutter in New York City, or Eric will talk to somebody who's building a new Victorian in Southern California, and, and it's all kind of going on at the same time. <laughs> Blue Ox is kind of an octopus, isn't it, with tentacles going in every direction, and it wasn't meant to be that way, and it surely wasn't ever planned. I can tell you that, 35 years of doing this, I didn't, I didn't have a plan one. We started doing the mill works when the logging market fell apart. There were no jobs. I mean, we had this huge cavernous building with Eric and one guy, and no income, nothing. We have the mill work happening, and we're doing custom mill work all over the United States. We've got a national reputation for it. We have the tours happening, um, and the tours happen because I started this company on a, a $300 bank loan, so I never had any money to, to buy new equipment, so I scavenged uh, all of the equipment that you see around here I found in the woods around this county, thrown away and abandoned. And then I bring it here, refurbish it, make it work again, and then teach myself how to use it. And in, in that process, unwittingly, we opened a museum, never meaning to at all. It just happened. And it was the city council that came down and said, we want you to open for tours because you don't know it, but you're a working museum. Jack McKellar was our city councilman at the time. And he came down one day and he took us up to Trees of Mystery which he helped build after um, when it did its major expansion in the 60s. And it's huge, you know, multi-million dollar operation, very, very successful. And he said, you guys have just as much or more to offer as these guys. We came back, and six weeks later, we opened for tours, and we were on CNN Headline News. <laughs> and that's how it went. And then we just kept adding on. We just kept building more and more stuff. I had to build a blacksmith shop in order to keep this, this old junk running because... All of these companies are long since out of business, so um, anything we break, we have to make and fix ourselves. We had to build a foundry to, um, to cast new parts. We had to build a machine shop in order to do the, uh, in order to machine the parts. Then I got into ceramics and thought I'd make ceramic tiles, and we built a ceramic shop. Well, all of a sudden, we had all these facilities that were only being used very occasionally. And uh, the school system came down and said, we've got this special needs group of students. Um, do you want to partner together? So then the school started up. So we worked informally with, with different kids for about 10 years. A counselor about 15 years ago called up here out of the blue and said, we've got a 15-year-old uh, little boy that we're losing through the cracks and there's nothing I can do about it. Can I bring you down and introduce them to you? I thought, yeah, okay, that'd be fine. I don't know why, but that'd be fine. Um, well, he turned out to be a great kid. He was living on the street, a uh, great little boy, and, uh, and he was being kicked out of junior high forever. Um, and I worked with him at nights in the blacksmith shop he was smart as a whip. There wasn't anything stupid about this kid at all. He was a really, really nice little boy. And uh, it turned out he did get back into school and, and all of that and, and did graduate from high school. And now he is a roofer in Texas. That began working with young people. Probably the reason I accepted to do that 
It was a group of men mentoring me when I was 16 in the woods that kept me on the path that I'm on or got me on the path that I'm on because it sure wasn't school. I didn't do well in school at all. And then a teacher that is a homeschool teacher approached us after taking a tour with his homeschool group and said, you know, I'm a teacher with the school district. Um, what do you guys think about setting up a, a real school program? And so um, the superintendent of schools, he was the assistant superintendent at that time, Gary Eagles, was very supportive, and we set this program up. I mean, it was a huge risk. You've got production, heavy machinery, dangerous machinery. You've got the public coming through, and you're going to put a bunch of kids there? You know, it was a real risk, <laughs> and it worked. It was logical, kind of. In my kind of logic, it was logical. Um, it just didn't ever pan out the way I thought it was going to pan out. <laughs> So it's pretty much been one mistake after the other leading up to today. Yep. And I got it figured that at 60 now, if I just keep making mistakes, I'll probably be okay. The type of students that we work with, a community school was originally court-ordered community school. So it was a system where kids who had been in trouble and could not go back to a regular classroom setting had to be given an opportunity to receive their education. So it has um, branched out a little bit. Not all the kids that we work with have been in juvenile hall. The large majority of them do have learning disabilities of different types. A lot of them are the type of people who have a real hard time sitting still for very long. They need to be moving. They need to be doing things. They need to be active. And so this type of setting fits into those learning styles. And so our goal is not that everybody who graduates is a master woodworker. You can't in four years, for one thing. But the main thing is that the students that work with us get a sense of their own self-worth, that I can do something, I can make something. And then that success carries over into other parts of their lives. And really, that's fundamentally what it's all about. The philosophy that's driven probably the whole thing all the way along, the philosophy that nobody knows, is uh, self-sufficiency. How do, we, how do we live on this planet comfortably with what we have around us? Eric will tell you we're building an ark. We have built an ark. It's a place where knowledge is saved and shared with the general public and with young people. And it's knowledge about how to live on this planet without technology and without fear. What we're trying to each of the students is, yes, printing and blacksmithing and, and wood turning and ceramics and all of that, but the way greater picture than that is to think, to be creative problem solvers. They come up with an idea. We want to paint the skid cam. Great. That's a great idea. Let's go out in the bay and dig up some bay mud, and we'll get some lime and uh, and we'll start from there. And they're looking at me like, what planet did you drop off of? And they said, well, why are we going to do all of that? Well, we're going to make our paint so we can paint the skid cam. What we're teaching them is how do you find the open door? Don't stop at the closed door. Keep looking for the open door. And that's what every employer in the world wants, employees that look for the open door. If you lined up 100 craftsmen every one of them woodworkers, and gave them the exact same problem, you're going to come up with 100 solutions. The, the key to that is every one of them is a solution. See, there's no right or wrong. It's getting the job done at the end. And that's what I learned in logging. And that was the, the real gift of that, is that nobody cares how many times you broke jokers. Nobody cares how many times a cat uh, flipped a track off. Nobody cares how much heartache and blood, sweat, and tears went into getting that log. All that anybody cares about is when the log reaches the mill. That's the only score that's being kept. There is nobody's keeping score on the rest of it. Nobody wants to hear about it. Nobody wants to do nothing. It's just get the damn log to the mill. And once you've done that, you've accomplished your job. And that's the, the way to tackle every problem. How do I get the log to the mill? Yeah, all through life, anything that I that I wanted, I made and uh, and made for myself. And I think it 
I think it stems back to my own handicap and not being able to read. Uh, you, you watch these students here and they use their brain like I do and they, they think three dimensionally. They can see the project that they're working on three dimensionally. They can see it done before it's done in their mind and then they're striving towards that three dimensional uh, image that they have in their mind. That's where they're headed. And I think that that's a terrific gift and the world needs people that can see and think three dimensionally. I try to tell them, play to your strength, not your weakness. The world's got plenty and plenty of people that read, write, and do math. Plenty of them. And those people have a, a talent and are great at it. You have a talent and are great at your talent. And play to your talent. One of the big things that we give the students is a, uh, is a sense of fitting with the community, of being part of this community. Not only being part of it, but being a successful and appreciated part of it. I remember Viviana and I saw this so uh, dramatically when we were in the second year of our uh, the truckers parade and we had the kids all on board the trolley and that's a long parade and it's freezing cold, it's in the middle of December, the people were tired. You know, the people on the sidelines were tired and they'd be waving, yay, yay, yay. And then they'd see the trolley and then they'd see Blue Ox School and they just light up and oh, blue ox, blue ox, yay! The message being sent for these kids was so powerful from that that they were a respected and wanted part of this community. Those kids just floated off of the trolley at the end of the parade and they do that every year um, in both the roadie parade and the truckers parade. I remember one time in the blacksmith shop here, we had a young boy, 18 years old, he was brand new here, and some people came by, and I happened to be around the corner, nobody knew I was there, nobody saw me, see, and these people were watching him for a minute, and then one of them said, what are you doing, and it stumped this kid, this is the first time in his life, maybe, that somebody said, what are you doing, and actually wanted to know, now think about it, they didn't say, what are you screwing up, they didn't say, what are you breaking now? They didn't say what kind of trouble you were getting into. They didn't, all of this list of things that this kid had heard his whole life, they didn't say any of those. They asked, what are you doing? And really wanted to know. And it threw him for a loop for, I bet you a minute, a minute he didn't know what to do. And then he started really shyly starting to tell them and, and they started oohing and on over what he was telling them, and boy, he held them there for half an hour and was talking in full voice at the end of it and was animated and, um, yeah. And it was, it was that quick that he changed and, and all of a sudden felt uh, that he had worth. When a person feels good about themselves, it shows in every part of their lives. And none of us is an island. We interact with everybody around us. Even a small group of people, a small group of students, feels good about themselves and carries that success into their lives. The people that they interact with, when they get married, when they have kids, their families, their friends, it ripples. And it ripples in a, in a big way, ways that we can't even measure. Yes, it is a small group of people that we work with, but it ripples out in a, in a bigger way. And then the other thing is that the people that come through here that the visitors from all over the world um, and, the, and the people in the local community, when they hear about the work that we're doing with young people, that changes the way that they view other young people. And so it's a, it's a two-way thing um, because really we're all, we're all part of the same team.